Well, you've heard from God's Word this morning, uh, but I would encourage you to have your Bibles open and keep your fingers in three places, okay? Acts chapter 20, uh, that'll be one place. Ephesians, of course, and then Revelation chapter 2. We'll go to all of those places this morning uh, as we uh, talk through this introduction to Ephesians. We really want to get a feel for the context of what we're going to hear over the next many weeks. Uh, but I want to ask you a question. Um, do, you, do you still get mail at your house? Okay, four of us still get mail at our house. <laughs> don't, don't you love it when you walk out to the mailbox and hidden among all the junk mail and the campaign brochures and the bills is that piece of personal correspondence. No. Okay, you don't love it. I do. Uh, I see that, that personal handwriting. I'm not talking about the handwriting font that the car dealer uses to try and make you think it's a personal letter. I'm talking about the real genuine handwriting. And I think to myself, what is someone going to say to me? Someone that knows me, a real person that knows me and I know them and I can't wait to get back to my house and tear it open and find out what is going on that they would write me a letter, a card, a note. The letter to the Ephesians is just this kind of personal correspondence. In fact, uh, the church at Ephesus is the church that Paul spent the most time with of any of his church plants. He loved them and he served them for, for three years. And, uh, and he has very strong desires for them. In fact, we heard it as we were reading through Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, he, he tells them that he wants them to be rooted and grounded in love, and that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that they may be filled with the fullness, all the fullness of God. That's Paul's prayer. And Paul's prayer has the same flavor as what we talk about when we talk about growing up here at CBC. We want you, we want each of us to dedicate, and we say it this way, your heart and your hands and your head to Jesus. And I think so many times Christians are out of balance with those things. They're more focused on one of those things than they are the other. And I see all the pictorial people looking at what's on the screen. I put on the screen a, a little diagram that, that sort of talks about this. It, it, it shows how we can get out of balance. And, and when we get out of balance in our faith, our faith becomes deficient. And, and this diagram depicts some of those deficiencies. You may be an incredible servant. Every ministry opportunity, too many to count, you volunteer. You say, I'll do that. I'll do that. So much so that uh, you spend a lot of time out of the service. In fact, I'm probably speaking to people who are over on the kids' wing right now. And, and you don't fill up your tank and you don't fill up your understanding of who Jesus is in the gospel. Or you may be that person that has all the head knowledge. You're in church every week and you go to multiple Bible studies every week, but you never actually get around to serving Jesus. You're lacking that outlet to put into practice everything that you have heard and everything that you know. But, but I think that the most fatal flaw is to ignore that issue of the heart. A heart's devotion to Jesus. Without a heart that is turned towards Christ, towards Jesus, turned towards the church, turned toward his people, a person is outwardly expressing their faith, but they have no genuine roots of salvation and of faith. It's a faith that's empty. Paul, Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians to explain these connections, heart and head and hands. Let me say it this way. In Ephesians, Paul is going to talk to us about this, that the church proclaims a gospel hope which results in a gospel culture, and these flow, things flow from a genuine heart relationship with Jesus. 
This morning we're going to look at the Ephesian church, and we'll, we'll be in Ephesians, the, the letter, but we're also going to look at the church at Ephesus in a couple of different places in Scripture. So first go to that passage in Acts chapter 20. Uh, the, the, the story of Paul in Ephesus actually starts in Acts chapter 19, and I would encourage you to read that whole passage, chapter 19 and chapter 20, this week. Uh, but we're going to look at the ending of the story in chapter 20. In fact, one of the things you'll find in Acts chapter 20, the, the, the passage just before this, is uh, uh, about a church service. And Paul preaches all night long, so we're going to apply that as well, right? And, uh, and a kid falls asleep. You guys will probably apply that this morning. Uh, but the consequence for him falling asleep is that he dies. So just be aware, okay? But Acts chapter 20, uh, what happens is um, you, you read this passage starting in, 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 in about, uh, let's see, in about verse 17 and then on to the end of the chapter. Paul is saying goodbye to this church for the final time. That, that he'll see them face to face for the final time. And what becomes evident is that Paul has this deep and abiding love for the church especially you can note verses 18 and 19 there, and that the love was reciprocated. You can see it in verses 36 through 38. But it's interesting that the love was expressed, and you'll see it on the screen, in him teaching them the truth about God, this gospel of hope. And so there it is in verses 20 and 21, in verse 27, and verses 31 and 32, he's declaring to them, he's proclaiming to them, he's uh, admonishing them from Scripture. And his letter to them then, the letter of Ephesians, the book of the Bible we call Ephesians, was written then several, several years after this, about seven years after this incident that we see in Acts chapter 20. And he's going to reiterate all the things that he had taught them while he was with them. That's the theme of those first three chapters. And then, of course, like we said before, the theme of the last three chapters, chapters four through six of the book of Ephesians, is Paul unpacking how that gospel hope works itself out in the life of the church, what I would call the gospel culture of the church, so that the things Paul says that are true from Scripture are evident in the life of the church as people look at that. Now, back to the book of Acts, chapter 20. He's preparing to depart after his long ministry with the church. And as he leaves, there's one thing on his mind. And he expresses this great concern for them. He says this, verse 29 of Acts chapter 20. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. It's actually... Uh, Verse 28, isn't it? No, it's verse 29. Yeah, yeah. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now that is a stark warning. And so, Paul puts the elders of the church on guard with these two com uh, commands. First, verse 28, pay careful attention, he says. He says, you're to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his blood. Remember, Paul had spent three years, three years showing these elders how to care by, by teaching the truth of the gospel, by sharing with them the implications of the gospel in life. And then in verse 31, again, he charges them with the second command, the elders to the elders, he says, be alert. So pay careful attention and be alert. And again, Paul has provided them with the example and he urges them, remember, for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. Paul has modeled for the elders the job for them and in his absence, he's asking them, just pattern your ministry after mine. Now, what exactly are they supposed to guard for? What, what form are these wolves going to take? Well, if we go back in history, we can understand that the city of Ephesus was famous. It was famous for being the center of worship for the goddess Artemis. And the temple dedicated to Artemis was this prominent feature of the city. It was 
maybe like a major tourist attraction. In fact, if you look at most of the uh, lists of the seven ancient wonders of the world, you've heard that phrase, the Temple of Artemis is one of those. And so people would come from all over and they would uh, both observe and worship Artemis. That it would be natural perhaps to think that the wolves would be some of these that would be trying to turn Christian thought to pagan worship. Or, also in Ephesus, this city, the worship of the Roman emperor was an expected feature of life there for the citizens. People, perhaps the believers, as loyal Roman citizens, might have been tempted to join in with what we would call an idolatrous syncretism. That word just means this, fusing the worship of the true God with religious practices from other belief systems. And so they think to themselves, well, I'm a Christian, but everyone else around me is paying homage and worship to the Roman emperor. Uh, Maybe I could just do that and still be a a Christian as well. Um, Maybe. Maybe those are the wolves. And besides those two cultural expressions, it wasn't just that there was Artemis worship and, and, and emperor worship. There was worship of all kinds of gods in the city of Ephesus. Additional threats to the faith that was centered on the exclusivity of Jesus as the way. In his letter, Paul's going to address these principalities and these powers set in high places, he says. And so he's thinking about those things. But in Acts 20, that's not Paul's concern. When he talks about these wolves, when he talks about the attack that is imminent, he's warning them that it's going to come from a different source. There in verses 29 and 30, he says this. He says that those fierce wolves attacking from the outside, they're going to come, look at it, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. It's possible that the church was on such high alert to everything that was happening around them, Artemis worship, emperor worship, worship of other gods, that they weren't ready to recognize the threat that was from within. And so Paul warns them. They were distracted. And I think sometimes we can get a little distracted as well, can't we? Uh, We're busy thinking about the LDS church, and we're busy thinking about the liberals, and we're busy thinking about the LGBTQ agenda that's going to come into the church. And often, in fact, I would say most often in the New Testament, the danger comes from within. When we're not discerning and when we're not faithful to hold on to the truth. So many people come in Jesus' name, fluent in Christianese, and they say Bible-y things and jesus things. But on closer examination, what they really do is they're twisting and distorting the truth of Scripture. And the effect is that people go, oh, that sounds right because I've heard that kind of thing before. And they follow after it and they follow right out of an orthodox understanding of what Christianity is. These people use and abuse Scripture to get you to believe things like this, that you have to do more things and better things to gain God's favor. Do better, try harder, just like we talked about last week. Or that you can guarantee God's blessing, financial, circumstantial blessing, if you just do what you're supposed to do. Now, the Bible talks about doing good. We talked about it last week. The Bible talks about blessing from God all over the place. And so in these lies, there's just enough truth that the lie is very, very, very subtle. It's shades of the truth. And Paul says, be careful. Pay attention. The more subtle the lie, the more dangerous it is. That, that's how Satan wants to attack the church. It's not going to be a full frontal assault, friends, because that's obvious and we're ready for it. Satan wants to attack the church of God, a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
a sneak attack. Dangerous teaching camouflaged. Maybe with a lot of flowery social media posts. Some scripture references attached. Hmm? I was in a room recently with a bunch of Christian people. This is not long ago. And a Christian speaker said to these Christian people, of which I was one, we are not concerned that every one of you becomes a theologian. We just want to train you to serve Jesus and love Jesus. Wrong. I had alarm bells going off in my brain. Theology, understand, is simply what one thinks about God. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think about God? Do people outside of the walls of this church think about God? Everyone thinks about God, and so everyone is a theologian. The only question is, are you a good theologian or are you a bad theologian? Do your thoughts about God, that theology, line up with the truth? About, do they line up with how he has revealed himself in Scripture? And I think too many people think of doctrine as cold and hard. And I want to say to you, it can be. We're going to look at the Ephesians in a second. They got there. But if a person's heart is set ablaze by what they know about God, that theology becomes warm and inviting. Let me give you an example. I'm an embarrasser, but I love my wife. Uh, that's not the embarrassing part. It's coming. <laughs> that's a good part. We, we've been married for coming up on 27 years. And as I think about how I love her today, compared with how I loved her the day we got married, and even the days before we got married, it's very, very different. When I married her, I was full of passionate desire and raging hormones, and that kind of defined my love in many ways. And now, some 26 and a half years later, my love is deeper, it is more substantial, it is more mature, it is more informed. And so, some of the youthful passion is gone, but my love for her is more vibrant. I hope, I hope you can ask her afterwards. I think that's true. <laughs> and so it is with the love of our Savior, right? It must mature and deepen and grow in its intensity and its vibrancy over time. In Acts, Paul challenges these Ephesians that every person is a theologian. Every Christian must understand their role as a theologian. And so Paul's letter is going to spend the first half emphasizing right doctrine. And, uh, and then the back half, of course, is, as we've said, outlining how that doctrine works itself out in life. But for that doctrine to be properly applied, it must be warmed by a love for Jesus. These are the two lessons, I think, that we can learn from the Ephesian church, especially this morning. In fact, I want to look at that second lesson with you. So turn with me to the book of Revelation and let's, let's see how they come to understand some of that second lesson. Here it is, Revelation chapter 2. Uh, Jesus is speaking to these seven churches, one of which is the Ephesians. And his assessment of this church in Ephesus is that they have done a really, really excellent job of holding the doctrinal line that he called them to in Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 2. two. You cannot bear with those who are evil, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. See, the wolves were rising up from within, and the Ephesians said, no, you say you're a Bible-believing Christian that doesn't line up with Scripture. They were really good. And that doctrine, it seems, has worked itself out into action. Look at what he says at the beginning of that verse, too. He says, I know your works your toil, and your patient endurance. The Ephesian elders, the Ephesian people, they were alert, they were careful, they paid attention, just as, as Paul had warned them in Acts chapter 20. But if we keep reading, Jesus' words 
and you may remember them, reveal this potentially fatal flaw in the church. Look at verse 4. He accuses them. You have abandoned the love you had at first. And as a result, Jesus questions the work that they're doing. That there in verse 5, it's the same work that he had just commended them for. He says, do the works that you did at first. The church was, was, was squeaky clean from the outside. But they were doing the right things for the wrong reasons, out of the wrong motivations. And to Jesus, that was just as bad as doing the wrong things. So he warns them, right? Look at it. Continue on. I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand. That's the church. I'm going to take your church away from you. I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. They believed all the right things. They were doing all the good things. But they are in danger of losing their church because they lack a heart connection to Jesus. They have lost their way because they have lost their why. Now here's how we talk about it, right? Back to that diagram. Adopted in, growing up, reaching out. That's our mission at Community Bible Church. And when we talk about growing up, we talk about ministry, we talk about giving, we talk about the spiritual disciplines, regular Bible reading and prayer. But listen to me. Unless a person does those things out of devotion to Christ, none of these things mean anything. Growing up begins in the heart. And then it spreads to the head. We, we, we acquire knowledge and we acquire truth and we, we, we know things from Scripture. And it works itself out in our hands. So we get involved in ministry and serving other people and loving other people. And anything different is a misunderstanding of biblical faith. And the answer is not to abandon good doctrine, biblical doctrine. The answer is not to stop doing good things until we feel a love for Christ. The answer is for us to realign our hearts, to rehearse in our minds and in our lives gospel truth, that gospel truth that the Holy Spirit will use to fan a flame of love for Jesus. That's why Paul is writing to the Ephesians. It's not just to assure that they have uh, in their minds all the right things to believe, all the right things to think, all the right things to say, that gospel hope, chapters 1 through 3. It's not just that they do good things, that they create a culture in the church that is defined by the gospel, chapters 4 through 6. But it's so that they'll remember their first love, a love for Jesus that's got to be the engine that drives gospel hope and gospel culture. And so if you go just real briefly right at the end here, go back to the letter to the Ephesians. This is how Paul opens the letter. He addresses it to the saints who are in Ephesus, who are, in, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And so Paul, because the Holy Spirit authored this letter with Paul, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us through the book of Ephesians. He wants to say to the saints at Community Bible Church, and you say, wait, 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 wait. Saints, that's not, that's not me. I'm not a saint. But Paul is not saying that the people of God were saints because they are perfect, not because of the accuracy of their doctrine, but because they were people the people of God, set apart for him. It is not doctrine that saves you. And as we'll learn in the next two weeks, it's God who calls you, Jesus who saves you, and the Holy Spirit who seals you for that final day. And it's to the praise of his glorious grace. That's what we're going to talk about in the next two weeks. I hope you'll be with us for those and beyond. But understand this, the church is called to proclaim that gospel hope it results in a church being different, having a gospel culture, 
And all of that is meaningful when it flows from a genuine love relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. I feel like that's the first prayer every week when I'm up here is a, a, a prayer of thankfulness because I am reminded that all of this is a result of Jesus who came and died and rose again and without his sacrifice and without the faith that we read about is even a work of you this morning, um, I, I would have no standing with you. But because of Jesus, because of his righteousness, that he's given me and that I'm clothed in, I have standing with you. And God, that drives me to my knees to say, praise you, worship you. And God, I, I want so badly to know the right things and to do the right things, but God, first allow me and allow CBC to be in love with you. And God, allow that to be the driver for our knowledge and our action. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for what it's going to teach us this fall. And we ask that you would be in it, that your Holy Spirit would be, uh, would be moving in our hearts to conform us to the image.